everybody for uh, coming to the panel and for staying to the end of the conference. We are, uh, one thing we talked about as a panel, that we knew that this was going to be the last uh, big panel before the end of the conference, and we made a commitment to end strong. Yes. So we're going to reward you for having been here. We're going to have some oh fun. Uh, not only because the content is great, but because we've got a really excellent set of panelists. So look, we've spent the last couple of days here as a community talking about some incredible science and, and some incredible impact on patients. It's been, a, it's been another great conference. Uh, uh, I, I love coming here every year. Uh, this is a perfect place to end, though. We're talking about what's next, what's the future. And uh, there's been a lot of excitement with uh, first-generation approaches for both in vivo, ex vivo, gene editing. And, uh, and, we, and you know, lives have been saved. Lives have been extended. Incredible progress have made. Products have been approved. Uh, but we know that there are shortcomings of those uh, approaches. We know that we can do better. And as an industry, we're committed to doing better. And we're very pleased to have a great collection, a great set of panelists um, to talk about what's next and where we can go and how we can improve the current approaches and do things that have not been done before. I, uh, I'm Faraz Ali, CEO of Tonight Therapeutics. We do, we're focused on the heart and do things in a modality agnostic way. So I joked at the panel that I'm not just a moderator, I'm a consumer. I'm interested to hear about what the future uh, holds and how we might be able to apply that uh, to the work we're doing at tonight. So without further ado, uh, let's get started into the panel. And I'd like to first just start with introductions. So uh, starting with you, Adrian, if everybody have asked each of them to introduce themselves and, uh, and, and a quick headline about what their company does. Go ahead, thank, Andrew. Thank you so much, Faraz. Uh, so pleasure and honor to be here with everyone today. My name is Adrian Bott. I'm Chief Scientific Officer at um, Capstan Therapeutics a new startup in San Diego. Uh, my background is in cell and gene therapy, and I spent a lot of time with Kite Gilead company uh, before Capstan developing uh, first-generation CAR T cells. And at Capstan, what we would like to do is to bring this treatment modality to in vivo programming of the immune system. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gary Fortin. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Shape Therapeutics. Uh, Shape Therapeutics is a uh, research stage, a preclinical stage company that is developing next generation RNA therapies that are precisely targeted to uh, the cell of interest by engineering uh, AAV capsids. Uh, we're based in Seattle. We have a satellite in, in, in Boston. And prior to Shape, I spent a lot of time leading the rare disease franchise at, at Bluebird Bio. And so I see a lot of my Bluebird Friends back there, congratulations on the approval. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic work. Really excited to be here today. Uh, Phil Johnson, CEO of Interius uh, Bio. We are a spin out of the University of Pennsylvania focused on targeted uh, cell delivery in, vi in vivo using engineered lentiviruses. Uh, first program is for in vivo CAR T. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvette. I lead up corporate development at Dino Therapeutics. My background's in neuroscience and oncology, came from cell gene and BMS. Now at Dino, we are focused on leveraging machine learning to optimize AV capsids for gene therapy delivery. And our business model is to partner out that innovation to enable gene therapy developers to make more efficient and safer gene therapies for patients. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Emil. I'm the CEO of Insoma. I'm also the chair of ARM and Blue Rock Therapeutics. Um, we, I, at, C at Insoma, we are um, an in vivo cellular engineering company that combines first in class engineering capabilities from SNPs to large insertions all the way uh, through to a first in class delivery tool uh, that targets the hematopoietic stem cell and the hematopoietic compartment. And our intent is to use that first in genetics to make, you know, it's just a much simpler uh, patient journey with a simple outpatient procedure to cure a genetic disease and in oncology and autoimmune disease to be able to manipulate multiple nodes of the immune system simultaneously uh, to address polygenic disease. Yeah, so that's great. And we've got a great panel here. What I love is that we've got people who've been on multiple slides. You've worked in cell therapy and you're doing something different. You were in ex vivo lenti and you're doing AV. So the panelists really will speak about their company and their approaches, but be bringing a wealth of experience from a lot of different areas. So, so let's get into it. Um, I think it'd be helpful to set the stage because you know a lot of us know a lot of things about uh, seen in cell and gene therapy, but not everything. So let's just set the need up. You know, so I said that we know that there are shortcomings. But let's talk a little bit more uh, about that. And we know that there's a long list of shortcomings for current approaches, but I'm going to ask each panelist to speak to the one that they care the most about, that they think is the biggest driver from their perspective for the field to move forward, um, whether from their past life or their current lives. So uh, let's start from the opposite direction. So Emil, you want to get started? Sure, I get yeah. to pick from yeah. the list. It is a long <laughs> list. We have a lot of challenges. But I think most of what we face 
uh, is much more is simplified with dose. So most of the problems we see are associated with really high dose vectors or, and vectors that aren't specific enough because so you have to go to a higher dose. So um, you, you solve that problem with uh, better targeting and um, you know, there's many, other, there's many other challenges, manufacturability, immunogenicity, uh, a lot of questions open, but I'd say you need a specific enough vector system that your dose is low enough that it's not, that the vector itself is not physiologically relevant. Great, you bet. Um, I'll tackle what I think is the boldest engineering challenge that uh, we certainly at Dino are, are tackling, which is packaging size for AAVs. Um, with this gene editing wave, I think there's a lot of really innovative machinery that today we just can't fit into that around 4.5 KB for AVs. It's Cas9 nucleases. There's a whole host um, of really innovative technologies that we're limited by today. Yeah, I would uh, echo what Emil just said. I think it's about targeting. I mean, you've got to be able to target specific cells, and in our case, to deliver DNA, not <coughs> RNA. So uh, if you can solve that, I, you know, maybe you've got a trip to Stockholm. Yeah, I mean, I have, to, I have to echo the same thing. For me, it's all about the patient. It's all about safety. Even though current therapies are safe, I think they can be safer. And, and figuring out a way to specifically target cells and deliver payloads in a very precise way um, so that we can lower the dose is, is going to be critical. And, and you know, you could have the safest, best product, but if you can't manufacture it, it's not a product. And so I think overcoming some of the manufacturing challenges is going to be critical as well. And I wished I could also subscribe uh, uh, beyond, behind the concept that it's about the target, but it's not only about the target. We spent 10 years actually trying to perfect ex vivo CAR T cell intervention in B cell malignancies, where we were never actually in a possibility to, uh, never created a possibility to cure more than 40% of patients with B cell malignancies, even with a perfectly validated targets such as CD19. So I think it is a matter of how we reprogram the immune system instead of replacing the immune repertoire with an incoming synthetic repertoire. Can we actually engraft novel synthetic repertoires and do something else to the immune system under the banner of globally reprogramming the immune system to hopefully eliminate the last cancer of cell in the body in all patients? Thank you. So reprogramming, I heard specificity, lowering the dose, manufacturability, packaging capacity, that's a, that's a pretty healthy list. So um, I'd love to now start, let, let's get into the meat of it then. How are we going to get better? And each of you are, you know, again, you've, you've got experience from your past lives and you've got your current companies. So um, I'll start with, uh, I, I, I'm just gonna keep shuffling it up. So Phil, I'm gonna start with you this time. Tell us a little bit more about the, the specific approach that you guys are taking to solving some of the problems that we've just talked about. Sure, so lentiviral vectors have been around since HIV was discovered, basically. And so it's, it's a, there's a long history of lentiviral manipulations. Uh, in recent years, by that I mean in, in my clock, 10 years is recent, um, there have been a lot of uh, tools brought to bear on engineering lenti vectors to do very specific things. And so we and others, it's, it's not just Interius, there are many other companies that are pursuing this, are looking at ways to actually change the surface of the vector so that you can directly target a specific cell. In our case, we are targeting T cells and NK cells with one single molecule. So we can actually uh, engineer uh, a wide variety of effectors with a single vector uh, at, at a reasonable dose, at least in, in non-human primates. The other thing that, it, uh, that what Adrian mentioned is I think is very important, and that is how, how, what else can you do? Because Yescarta and its, and its relatives are at best 50% over five years, 50% relapse after five years. So what can you do to change that? And the good news is in lenti vectors, we have room to add other pieces uh, of the puzzle. So we can re-engineer uh, immune responses. We can engineer the vector to do other things. We can engineer the T cells to respond to external agonists. So there's, there's a real big toolbox there that we can use. So there's multiple components that go into specificity, one of which is also including the promoter that you're using to drive the uh, transgene expression. Great, that's great. Yvette, you wanna talk about it? Sure, um, I think what really differentiates Dino is two things. One, our capsid design vision. We're really leveraging this unique machine guided design approach 
to multi-property optimize our AV capsids for gene therapy delivery. And just as a, a, a sense of scale, uh, we are reaching 2 billion new capsid measurements per month at this point in time. And the machine learning algorithms really allow us to transfer those learnings across serotypes, across species, um, and across different models so that we can hopefully maximize the ability to translate um, that set of effects um, and improve properties even to humans eventually. Um, the second big thing for us is really around resourcing. Um, we've got 100 FTE solely focused on AEV capsid engineering, which is a, a really large team, obviously, but to us that's the type of resourcing and the level of focus that we need in order to bring to bear on this challenge of delivery in order to make progress in this next decade. We've been focused and learning about AEV for decades now, and we haven't made quite as much progress as we've wanted to, and so we've built a company um, that's very partner-centric and focused um, to enable this gene therapy delivery challenge to be solved. And Gary, you're doing a little bit of AV, but they've also got the RNA side of things. So you want to talk about your approach and what does that unlock? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, SHAPE was founded to overcome challenges that we've all faced in, in the gene therapy world. And it's built across three pillars. And probably the, the unifying thread across those pillars is patient safety. Uh, one of the pillars is, as, as Faraz said, uh, to develop novel RNA therapies or, or RNA medicines. The, the, the idea there being that instead of permanently modifying the genome, that we're working through the RNA level. Um, you know, my, my CEO often makes the comparison to, you know, if your computer's broken, you don't go in and change the hardware. Rather, you um, do a software patch. And we think of RNA as that software patch, uh, and hopefully in a safer, more uh, tunable type of way. The second pillar is um, engineering AAV capsids to specifically target tissues. And um, we screen billions of capsids uh, directly in non-human primates so that we can identify that needle in a haystack, that one capsid that targets the CNS and nowhere else. And then the third pillar is manufacturing at any scale. And so we are using a stable cell line approach to, to manufacturing where we believe that we, we, we've shown that we can have um, higher yield, greater infectivity, um, greater quality uh, compared to a transient transfection system. And so when we take those pillars, we're hoping at the end of the day we're gonna have a safer, uh, more accessible therapy uh, for patients. Adrian? We also like to uh, capitalize on the concept of transiently programming tissues and immune cells, for example, in order to actually mobilize or co-opt the endogenous immune system in addition to um, leveraging the cognate interaction between a chimeric antigen receptor and, and the target. Um, but we also would like to capitalize on um, fully synthetic platform technology that will afford a higher degree of control from the standpoint of achieving uh, the AUC that meets a therapeutic efficacy and safety bar in a particular clinical indication. So we like to integrate those features in our platform technology, lipid nanoparticle feature um, together with precision delivery and engineering of one or multiple cell types that may work in concert with each other, something that we have been struggling with in the past with um, ex vivo CAR T cell intervention. And the last, at last but not least, the feature of multiplexing, multiple payloads and sometimes not only chimeric antigen receptors or antigen receptors in general, but also biological response modifiers that would allow us uh, to maximally leverage uh, the platform technology. Thank you. Awesome. Um, what, there are, if you go to Wikipedia, there are over 200 cell types in the body. There's hundreds of diseases we could choose to pursue. We know that engineered cells work. Um, so it's really about what problem you're trying to solve. None of us are gonna solve all of them today. Maybe one day, one of us will, but, so it's really about what challenge you choose. Um, so the reason I went to Insoma was because I came to believe that the single most disruptive thing we could do to change as many diseases as possible would be to engineer the immune system in vivo. And so I think we have a common element here with many of us. Um, it's about how you do that, what your goals are, but 
Um, and so I was looking for a platform that would allow me to, uh, to do that and to durably engineer it, because I think we maybe we differ on that. We could have a fun mm -hmm. argument about that. But um, our approach is to durably engineer either the peripheral or the bone marrow compartment, or both, um, to affect complex disease. But if you really want to do that, if you want to use the power of the immune system, for example, to address in a solid tumor or complex polygenic disease, then you need combinatorial therapies. So you need, you know, first of all, high efficiency targeting, but really high payloads. You need to be able to deliver either transiently or durably in integrating, which I think the vector, it's, we would argue probably, but that's, I believe, important to do. Um, so that's what the uh, virus-like particle that we have at Ensoma allows us to do. It allows us to insert 35 KB of new code into the nucleus of the target cell, not the cytoplasm, but the nucleus. And that's a critical distinguishing factor. Um, and you can do that all on one vector. You can make transient or permanent changes from one vector. So that, that's what attracted me to it. Mm -hmm. You know, turning on um, the things we've talked about, it's come across multiple times, but multiple effector cells simultaneously, multiple payloads. The, the future of a solid tumor is a combination therapy. The only question is whether you're going to develop one element and then try to partner to make this complex business-to-business mm -hmm. -business relationship, or you're going to go in in one step. Mm -hmm. and affect that combination therapy. So that's what, that's what we think differentiates us. Um, and it would be fun to argue whether we're really, whether that, any of those, some of those things are needed. Um, but I believe they are. Yeah, so let's get into that. I'd, I'd love a little bit of argument. We, we yeah. promise to spice it up a little. So let's just go ahead and have that. Now let's, one thing that's come up consistently at this conference is it's all about delivery, right? So we've talked about a lot of different approaches here, but let's double tap, uh, click on that for a second because so we can, we, we know that in the case of Yvette and, and Gary, it's AEV, engineered AV, make those better, and I believe, though, still the same carrying capacity, correct? I just want to confirm that. We're working that. on it. What's that? Working on <laughs> working that. On. Uh, there you go. You heard it here first. Um, but for the three of you, for Emil and, and, and Adrian and, um, and Phil, you're talking about different delivery, and that's what's enabling two things, I think. At one level, it's enabling going from ex vivo to in vivo with a new delivery vehicle, and enabling maybe not to be completely limited by the carrying capacity of, uh, you know, you just gave, you threw a number out there. Mm -hmm. So let's just, I'm gonna ask you three to speak a little bit about what is different on the delivery side? What is this new thing that you're doing that has not been seen before? Yeah. Uh, and the, and, then, and yeah. then what does that enable? What is that carrying capacity? Right. Uh, you may have, you already gave your number, um, but let's talk a little bit about the new delivery vehicle that each of you are using, because I don't think the audience would yeah. know off the, off the bat what that actually is. Yeah. You want to go, you want to sure. start this time? I mean, just to clarify, just to add to what I said. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a virus-like, we use a virus-like particle based on helper-dependent adenovirus. So it's 400 million years of evolution, trillions and trillions of experiments to come up with this super efficient delivery vehicle that not only finds the target cell, but then crosses, binds to the cytoskeleton, translocates, makes a pore, injects its DNA. It is exquisite and beautiful in, in, in that sense. So we, you know, we, uh, we leverage that. It's fully helper dependent, meaning we've stripped the entire genome. There is no viral genome left. So you have the full 35 KB packaging capacity. So it's not yesterday's adenovirus. And frankly, that's part of the reason I was excited to do this, because I think the field has completely overlooked the best delivery vehicle we have for reasons that made sense maybe at the time. But we've got 20 years now of progress, and this is an amazing vector. Um, so that's what we use it for. Now, we've further engineered it. We've um, made it a chimeric of two different serotypes to give it the specificity we want, and then we've introduced point mutations to make it more specific. So we can talk about that. But that's, yep. that's the, in the end, that's what it is. 35 KB to the nucleus. And it's an With a adeno, single in vivo it's a, injection. It's, it's an adeno shell. It's, a it's virus an adeno thing. capsid. Yeah. 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 Yep. yep. Okay. Adrian? Definitely uh, one of the reasons for which we uh, prioritized mRNA, modified mRNA, was actually to be able to scale up and scale out the concept of uh, CAR T cell uh, therapy outside oncology, where the therapeutic bar may be lower, but the safety bar is much higher. So to us, it was a fascinating concept to transiently reprogram the immune system 
and redirect that way immune effector cells against pathogenic cells and diminish their burden in, in, in the body. And this is in principle applicable as uh, our founders published uh, to regenerative medicine fibrosis as well as outside that area in autoimmunity, inflammation, and so on and so forth. But this concept could also be applicable in, to oncology because through this approach utilizing synthetic lipid nanoparticles that are decorated with protein binders for select uh, targets on immune cells, you could deliver a mRNA that uh, translates multiple CARs or T cell receptors biological response modifiers capable in principle to co-opt the endogenous immune system on top of the initial heat afforded by CAR antigen interaction. So what is the, but just the, the double click on the actual delivery vehicle, could you describe what the delivery vehicle is? Yes, lipid nanoparticle based delivery. Um, and these it's lipid targeted lipid nanoparticles. These, these lipid nanoparticles are actually decorated with uh, binders right. for specific targets. So target delivery and engineering of one or multiple subsets of cells Perfect. loaded with mRNA. And by the way, the payload is also amenable to delivering gene editing machinery. So we are looking also at permanent reprogramming of cells in vivo. So when you think about carrying capacity, like his number, we know their number is 4.7 working on it. His number is 35. We, what do you, how do you describe your carrying capacity? We are not yet, we believe that we are not yet limited by delivery capacity. We are looking though at uh, chimeric antigen receptors which do not pose any issues from the standpoint of delivery capacity. In the future, we'll be looking at um, larger uh, payloads, but we may not need to go there due to the multiplexing capability of this technology. Yep. And in fact, you don't have to make it all fit in one. You could, exactly, Absolutely. that's part of the- part We call of the, it mixed product. Exactly. And, and this will allow us to mix and match different specificities and targets and actually access or broaden up our portfolio in terms of clinical indications that way. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I'll take sides. I'll, I'll vote with Emil. Um, I think you do need to have a durable uh, persistence of CAR T's, and that means putting it in the genome to make the CARs. I think that's going to be an essential part of doing in vivo CAR T's. The beauty of the lentivirus system is that we can turn integrase on and off, so we don't have to integrate. We can when we want to. So we can make non-integrating lentiviruses as well, which look a lot like AAV then, because now we're delivering an episome basically to a target cell. The other thing about our system and, and the others that are working in the same uh, domain are we can simply swap out the binder and target any cell we want to. So for example, we can target solely CD4 cells, and we can reprogram those to become T-Rex, as an example. We can target hepatocytes very specifically with a specific binder to target the liver. And it goes on, and, and Emil said something interesting, there's, there's 200 different kinds of cells, and really only the question is what's accessible to, to the vector, because we can target basically any cell. Got it. And so if I sort of rough division of the world here, those four, viral, like, you know, virus-like particles, you know, um, um, uh, mm -hmm. a pseudotype, maybe lenti envelope, AAV engineers, and then this is the one non-viral. And I know that there's other flavors of non-viral. That'll be <laughs> or, an another panel next AGNTN. year. Let's there, gang there, up on there, it. there are folks in this audience who I've spoken to today <laughs> doing some incredible work in the non-viral delivery <laughs> space, and that'll be a panel in the future. But that's, I think, a rough division here of, uh, of labor. Now, just with everybody's uh, delivery, you know, everything goes to the liver, right? So uh, I'm just curious, and you know, we all talked about the importance of safety. Um, so I, I'm just curious as we're thinking about it, part of, you're able to marginally maybe reprogram or get it to certain cells, but just to clarify, is everybody still, majority of what you're doing, still going to the liver? Is that the case? I'll, I'll show, anybody can speak up in any order. No. All right. <laughs> no, let's, I got it smacked. Yeah. No, I think that's a really important, well, Certainly, that's a failure mode in the past for virus and virus-like mm -hmm. particles. Um, so that was a high, that was a very high premium for us. Um, we've engineered it so that it doesn't. We, we see de minimis or very <coughs> undetectable uh, transduction of the liver. We've now done, at Insoma, 14 monkeys now uh, with a completely clean profile. They really don't even see the vector. You get this little blip of an hour or two in IL-6, and then it's, and you can't, and when you look at every other cytokine, C-reactive protein, most, most sensitive but non-specific marker you've got, and it's, it's, it's the same as the vehicle. 
So I think it is possible to engineer these vectors. Um, I think we, we, you know, we'll of course know animals are not perfect predictors. We know that. Yeah. So well, we'll but at least that. in the animal models we have, we'll get mice that. and non-human primates. So not really going like, to deliver. All right. Yeah. And then Gary, yeah. I saw you vigorously yeah. shaking your head too. Absolutely the same. We, we've engineered the capsid so that it's a thousand fold enriched in the CNS and is not in the liver. No liver. No liver. You heard it here, folks. No liver. All right. What about you, Yvette? Yeah, I would say the same. I mean, I think the multi-property optimization is critical. We want to be able to enrich. And what's really interesting about AAV is that we've got 20 to the 735 possibilities. And so what we want to do is we want to efficiently navigate and explore that space. And how do you do that best? We think um, it's definitely with machine learning. So um, I think for us, it's really thinking about mapping out what the fitness landscape looks like, finding those local maxima, finding those global maxima. And we still think there's a lot of opportunity um, out there with AV. So similar to, to Gary, certainly focused on the CNS, the mus muscle, eye, as well as liver. Do you believe, between the two of you that I'm hearing, is you believe it's possible to engineer AV to just not have to go to the liver, to de the liver, which is outstanding. That would be incredible for the field because that's been the major limitation of otherwise very, very exciting work in AV. So that's exciting to hear that. Um, Adrian, what about you? Yes, I would like to add that in addition to manipulating the composition, for example, of lipid nanoparticles to sharpen up the biodistribution that you need at organ level, you could also modulate the sequence of the mRNA to diminish the expression in certain organs, such as liver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah same, same exact thing that Emil said. One interesting caveat for us, and I presume others that are engineering T cells is, our, one of our immunologists spoke up and said, you know, T cells move around. And so what you tend to find are T cells in most organs. So you have to be careful as you look at a signal, whether or not it's actually in a T cell or in a hepatocyte. Right. And, and, and I, I, you know, what are the, you know, if you had to think about it in terms of, so one thing we know that this is gonna help with is safety. Right. We all care about putting patients first. Safety is incredibly important. So what I love to hear from all of you is that there's a way to detect deliver, which has been a, 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 a problem. What else does the, your technology unlock? Can we now get to yeah. patients that we simply couldn't get to before yeah. with first generation approaches? Yeah. Or we're getting to the same patients, but because of the therapeutic index, maybe we can get to less severe patients. How would you describe the, uh, you know, if there was a pie of what we could do with first generation efforts, how much more are we expanding the pie yeah. with what you're doing? Yeah. Um, and, and, and just in terms of people, we can get to new patients, new diseases. Uh, uh, so I'd love to hear that. Uh, Gary, do you want to start? Yeah, so definitely, we definitely think through, maybe not with the caps, with the AV caps, but with the RNA approach that we're unlocking way more diseases, um, you know, moving from the monogenic to the, to the much more complex diseases. Um, you know, so we're, it, it's early stages. I don't know. I don't have a whole lot to say on the topic, but that's one thing where you know I think we've been limited in the past to these rare monogenic diseases, and as we kind of evolve the, the payloads and the and the delivery mechanisms, we can open up some of these more complex diseases and start chipping away at those as well. Phil. Yeah, our uh, our thoughts. Our, the company was basically founded because of the frustration of an immuno oncologist to get access to CAR T cells yeah. for a yeah. variety of purposes having to wait two weeks, three weeks to get uh, patient cells manufactured and back. So the concept was simple, let's just do away with all the ex vivo uh, manipulations and make it off the shelf. So this was obviously the same concept with allergenic ex vivo cars is that you call the pharmacy and they bring over the vial to the clinic and you inject it. And that's really a focus of ours is to make sure that it's, it's accessible within you know, hours of a diagnosis that the patient can be treated without having to wait for apheresis and all the other things that go on in manufacturing ex vivo products. Um, I will slightly disagree with Gary. I think that you can certainly expand the patient population, and that's our aim at Dino through delivery itself. And I'll walk you through the, the multiple properties and we can th think about it that way. But first of all, we can efficiently transduce target regions and organs that we and cell types that we haven't been able to do before. That's huge. That's opening up the patient population. 
right there. Secondly, thinking about deep diversification of mutations beyond and away from what wild type serotypes are today for AV allows us to begin to change up the epitopes that are on the surface that those neutralizing antibodies bind to. So it, open up, it opens up the opportunity to truly treat more patients that otherwise wouldn't have been able to access these therapies. And then last but not least, manufacturability is probably something that we'll talk about in a little bit as well, but thinking about how we can increase the potency of these vectors such that we can actually bring down those doses and actually viably manufacture at large scales these therapies for broader patient populations that to date haven't been able to be treated either by these novel modalities either. Adrian? So from the standpoint of uh, <coughs> CAR T cell intervention, transitioning from ex vivo CARs to in vivo CARs, in addition to scalability, feasibility, manufacturing, and the off the shelf nature of uh, in vivo CARs, one aspect that I think is critical and has been, at least for us, in context of ESCART and anti-CART to some major access problem was the clinical performance of ex vivo CARs in terms of toxicity and need for lymphodepletion conditioning. So we are completely changing the paradigm by going in vivo to in vivo CARs. We don't need to replace the immune system. Hence, we don't need to perform lymphodepletion conditioning. We are engrafting a novel synthetic immune system. And that may create the possibility and pave the way to moving the CAR paradigm to outpatient setting and earlier stage disease indication, which has been a problem with ex vivo CARs. Thank you. Yeah. I know what you're going to say. Um, I still want to hear from you. <laughs> I, uh, I would say we're talking about two different yeah. fundamental challenges in genetic disease you know, we know how to cure genetic diseases. We just, it's possible but not practical. I mean, we'll have, we have a, an approved therapy for beta thal now. Sickle, we'll probably have an approved CRISPR therapy next year and we'll treat 1% of the patients. And that's for one set of reasons. And then in oncology, we have a different barrier. So in genetics, it's about not putting the patient through six months of this incredibly difficult procedure, two months without an immune system. So that, that par you have to get rid of that paradigm and that, you know, a high efficiency in vivo delivery tool promises to do that. Mm -hmm. But you have to heritably engineer the bone marrow to do that. So you have to have a tool. So I think we, we hope we have the promise of that with a single durable engineering event. And if you could do that, then you can take that 1%, you know, much broader to, to mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands, mm -hmm. millions of people. So we're very excited about that. Heritably engineering, fixing a broken gene. But in oncology, the limitation really is either durability or the polygenic nature or the complex suppressive control in a solid tumor. And those are different problems that it's not about, you know, it's, it's not just about being able to fix one thing. It's about being able to fix multiple things simultaneously, safely. And so I think that's the common element that I've heard multiple times is maybe the phrase would be synthetic immunology, but this idea that you need to turn on you know, innate killer cells and, um, you know, modulatory monocytes and you need checkpoint inhibitors and cytokine, inflammatory cytokines. All, this is how the body cures a solid tumor. So I think that's the limit, the limitation right now. Mm -hmm. It's even the limitation, frankly, in the liquid tumor space too, but not the severe. So we hope we address both of those in different ways. And the panelists are talking about one or the other, yep. it feels like. I, what I love it is, I mean, if you take a step back, what I'm hearing is, of course, as it expand the pie and the different approaches do it in different ways, you can tackle diseases that you couldn't tackle before, you know, so you right. open up the pie that way. Within the diseases you're already serving, you might be able to reach more patients, either because the safety profile is approved or the setting. You don't have to do, you could go to community clinics. You can, but then the, the, the really exciting thing is by going away from ex vivo to in vivo and maybe better manufacturing, maybe we might be able to bring down the cost of goods mm -hmm. and reach parts of the world yeah. and entire geographies that are just a blip on the radar screen for most of the current companies today because we just can't get the cost down low enough to have a, a viable price in some of those countries. So right. hopefully I've summarized it. Is there something I didn't uh, miss there in that sort of expansion of the pie? Anybody want to add something to that? Efficacy, potency. We yeah. can't hope to cure each and every patient mm -hmm. with ex vivo CAR T cells because recall, we have to disable the endogenous immune system. It's quite frustrating mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. us spending so much time in that area. But I think we have that shot with in vivo global reprogramming of the immune mm -hmm. system. Yeah, so just, just to amplify that for yeah. just a second. So 
Adrian brings up a very important point is that when you, uh, if you don't lymphodeplete, if you don't treat the patients with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, the exovivo CAR Ts don't work. They just simply don't work. And if you ask 10 immuno oncologists why that is, you'll get 10 different answers, um, <laughs> which means nobody really knows. Nobody knows. All we do know is that you have to wipe out the endogenous immune system for it to work. With our approach and with Capstan's approach and with Emile's approach, the, you're not going to do that. Why? Because you're going to wipe out your target cells. You can't, you can't lymphodeplete, which is obviously a very positive thing for the patient. If you go and ask patients, um, having gone through multiple rounds of this very toxic chemotherapy, this is a big plus for them. But the thing that's sort of not talked about a lot because it hasn't really been proven yet is leaving that endogenous immune system intact offers the opportunity for that endogenous immune system to participate in tumor elimination. It's called epitope spreading or antigen spreading. So your, your, your immune system now has the opportunity to not only be uh, programmed to fight the cancer, but those cells that aren't programmed now can be called in to fight the tumor. So it's a really, we talk about faster, better, cheaper. We just talked about cheaper. We know about faster. This is a possibility for it to be better, better, better and safer. Yeah. And that, um, so we're we're gonna now. I'm gonna get the panel to start talking about. We've heard about all the promise of these approaches, and now we're gonna get into the risks and uh, you know the the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Uh, but I wanna give the the audience a fair warning. We will be giving you an opportunity to ask questions, and so. Start getting them ready. The, those little cool mics are going to start getting ready, and, and, and we'll make sure that we have a few minutes of Q&A before we get to closing comments. So get those questions ready. So let's turn to the, the other side of the ledger. Right? We know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. We know that there's going to be things that we know or can anticipate will be challenges and risks, as well as the unknown unknowns. And it's taken us, I like, I've had this conversation with many, many people at this conference. It's taken us several decades to get to the point where we both have the breakthroughs and the products and, and all the promise we've seen, and to figure out the limitations of these approaches. AVs have been around for you know, decades, and we, you know, we have Zolgensma treating kids with SMA and curing them, but now it's taken us only, it, after all that time, in the last year or two, we finally figured out, whoa, there's dose-limiting toxicities, and there can be death. So one question I asked of the panelists before here is like, given that history, that it often takes decades, and including in humans, before you really know what you have, and before both good and bad, is there any, you know, what are the rocks beneath the surface here that we need to think about, and is there anything that you can do in your preclinical work to guarantee that the translation of all this promise is going to actually be realized in humans, and to mitigate or, you know, identify those risks so that we don't have to figure it out. Is this going to go any faster than what is, this, or is it going to be three decades from now, you guys will all still be up here and saying, oh yeah, you know that stuff we talked about three, you know, we, we, we got it wrong. So just talk through the risk mitigation, identifying uh, what we've learned from history and looking forward from your technologies, will we be any better at figuring this out, stuff out and figuring out the safety, particularly immune reactions? Mm -hmm. So anybody can go first. Well, let me, let me just, used the line I've used for about 30 yep. years, mice lie and monkeys don't always tell the truth. <laughs> so you can depend on animal models all you want to, but I can tell you that in the AV world, which I spent a lot of time in, none of this was available. Um, the, the, the reactions that have happened in the clinic were not available in mouse or in monkey models. So you really won't find out until you get into humans is the, is the real bottom line on this. But what can we do ahead of time? We can do all the things that we normally do in animal models to assure ourselves that we're not uh, creating immune um, situations where you um, will get untoward reactions. I'll use adenovirus as the example of that. Feel uh, free. <laughs> yeah. We don't and, do that. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, where, where there was evidence of animal toxicity, um, the patient was dosed and the ultimate uh, outcome. Yeah. So I think today we have much better tools at looking at immune responses, um, but you also have to look at the vector itself. So as Emil said, how, how long has adenovirus been around? Millions, millions, millions of years. Well, most of our genomes made up of retroviruses, so welcome to the party. Um, there are, have been retroviruses around since the beginning of time. Um, we talk about lentiviral safety, and the truth of the matter is, if you think about HIV having been around at least 50 years in humans, maybe even more like 100, and you think about the number of infections that have occurred, which is in the hundreds and hundreds of millions, and you think about then the number of integration events that have occurred, which are infinite. 
there's been no case of cancer associated with HIV infection. So we know that at least with HIV, which preferentially targets CD4 cells, that the integration events have not led to cancer. Then if you focus down on CAR T cells, there have been thousands of patients treated with CAR T cells now. This is not HIV itself, this is a VSVG lentivector that has transduced PBMCs in culture. Mm -hmm. Number of integration events is almost incalculable again, no, no cancer. So we think the lentivirus system is safe, at least as best we can tell. We've dosed monkeys as has uh, in Soma and seen no safety signals whatsoever, um, no transaminase elevation, no hematologic abnormalities, but we're really not gonna know until we do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Bill said. I think there's three different approaches that we've thought about in terms of hitting this immunogenicity problem. And first is the animal models. I think we can do the best that we can to transfer learnings via our machine learning models across animals. We've tried different species of NHPs alone, mice, you know, primary human cell lines, organoids, you name it. I think everything that we do is in service of trying to translate to humans, but we really don't know until we until we test it out ultimately in humans. But the second approach is diversifying as much as possible. I mentioned changing up the epitopes, for instance, and our vision is to be able to create these fully synthetic capsids that truly can evade the immune system in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And then last but not least, I think there are some really interesting novel approaches that we can also learn from nature. We can think about those bacterial enzymes, for instance, that can cleave IgG. Um, IDES, for instance, and we can think about how we might be able to apply that and enable new ways of thinking about redosing, for instance. So I think there's different approaches and we can think about immunosuppressants, for instance, that can be prophylactically administered. There's a lot of different um, ways to do that, but I think there are non-sequence design oriented approaches as well. Let, let me just add a note of caution. When I put staphylococcal or streptococcal enzymes into you, you're gonna have an immune response. Oh, yes, exactly. So. And any particulate capsid that you put in is going to generate an immune response. What you're trying to do is evade pre-existing immunity, exactly. I think. Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, okay, so are we moving fast? I mean, I'm any tremendously way to, optimistic. Any way to figure this I'm out. I'm tremendously optimistic we're moving faster. Right? So the data shows it, yeah. right? Um, I think we've solved all of these challenges until we discover we haven't, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think your, pro your question falls in a couple different categories. What have we learned about how to design? Um, what have we learned about how to manufacture? There's different categories there. I think we've learned fundamental things about design, about safety switches, about overlapping layers of control, about the value of promoters that regulate the sequence only in the target or that turn on your machinery, your engineering machinery only in your target cell. So there's you know, an enormous wealth of data if you can take advantage of it. I think we've learned a lot about manufacturing. I think we've all, we're all solving today's challenges. Yeah. The problem is we can't entirely predict tomorrow's. Oh. Um, but they're gonna be, you know, but we're, we're definitely in a moment of a step change here. Um, and all these technologies are gonna solve one unique, you know, a challenge in their own unique way. So. Um, you know, I guess one, maybe the one I'll riff on would be the, um, the idea of what have we learned about uh, content and design inside the vector, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and how can we control and, um, and target the payloads in a smart way um, with circuits that only turn on in situ responding to the physiology or with uh, safety switches that are default or that are only, it's quiescent until activated. All that's possible. We're trying to do that, we think of it as seven layers, um, and we're trying to do that from, it starts from, is your vector targeting at high efficiency the first, the place you wanna go and not others? But it goes all the way down to the, the default kill switch at the bottom. It, do you have a way to stop it if you don't like what's happening? We see seven of those. Right now we can enable two or three of them. We know our goal is to enable all seven. Um, kill so switches. Um, kill switch is the bottom. Yeah. You know, is the, is the, you don't want to have to use that. Yeah. But it's, you think of it as the smallest part of the circle. Yeah. At the top part, it's about how specific is your vector. Um, that, you know, we, we worked on an, an hematopoietic specific promoter so that if our vector ends up in the lung, then the machinery is the, turned off. The transposase, the recombinase, the payload, whatever it is. It just, so hopefully mm -hmm. that would do. So that's maybe one of the things we've learned. We're trying to implement. That's great. No, I mean, so I've heard a couple of different things. This one is, first of all, awareness is half the battle. 
So we've learned something from the limitations and then that we can put that prospectively into our thinking going forward. Part two, each of you have tools and ways to design things in a way with you know, a certain mm -hmm. targeting ligands, kill ligands, ways to sort of do this better with the knowledge that you have. Um, the third thing that I heard was, um, you know, Yvette, I, you said, I, I forget exactly what you said, but something like 200 million learning events like with AI. Billion. It, it, that? it was a bigger number. No, it was it a was bigger two, billion. It was 20 billion. to the 750. It was something like that. It was the sound bite but we need capture, to get for the meeting. It's, the capture <laughs> of learning, which I thought was fascinating, that with the new tools that weren't available a decade ago, what you might be able to model in a way that was never possible before. But then I, in the end, I finally, I agree with you, Phil. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know until we get to humans. And that part, I think we have to have the humility to realize that we should be able to do better with all the other things, but the mice will lie, the, you know, <laughs> the monkeys won't tell the truth, and we won't know until we're humans. And so we have to have the humility to realize that there will still be safety considerations top of mind. Okay, great. Well, I, I hope the audience has uh, done their job. These guys have done their job so far. And are there questions from the audience for our esteemed panel? And people don't normally do it, but I'm going to start cold, cold calling. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see one hand up. Is this thing on? Hello? Uh, yep, it's working. Okay, great. Thank you for the talk. Um, very excited about in vivo CAR T. If we think about the preclinical path for ex vivo CAR T, it's mainly humanized mouse models and perhaps non human primates for toxicity. How do non-human primates fit into the preclinical efficacy or function for in vivo CAR T? And does that, if you need to show NHP T cells being edited, does that mean your binding domains have cross BC specificity and you know other layers of complexity? Yes. <laughs> yes to which part? <laughs> the first part of the sentence. Every every part. Yeah. yeah. So so we have designed our vector to work in monkeys to knock out B cells. So, it, and it works, but it also works on humans. <laughs> so it, it's the product we'll be putting in humans, we'll be, we test in, in non-human products. Thanks. Anybody else? Do you think it's necessary? There's His a, question was, while they're waiting, do you think it's necessary there, to do the non-human primate model for oncology, or is it that you're just, a, you're just an overachiever. Yeah. Well, yes, absolutely. There's no question <laughs> about that, Emil. Um, it, it clearly is not required. I, mean, I, I think that, that because there are no cancer models in monkeys, right. right? And the cancer models in mice are contrived at best, right? Yeah. So I think it's not necessary. We thought that being a first in human product like this, it would be um, advantageous to be able to show it actually yeah not only is, is safe, but also efficacious in hand. Mm -hmm. There was a question over there. Yeah, uh, these are all great technologies, and hopefully in a perfect world, they'll all work. Um, but one thing that we haven't addressed is the downstream problem of manufacturing. I mean, if these work, they're going to have that community setting application. And with that community application, you need to have greater product uh, access. Um, and you know, there's already a bottleneck in lentiviral vector production now, so how are we going to address the manufacturing capacity that's going to be needed to get broad application of these technologies? Maybe let me, uh, let's do two things with that question. One is just, are there specific manufacturing risks and challenges or opportunities that you're solving with your approaches? That's part one. That's a technical question, but then there's also the capacity. How's the field going to deal with all this new stuff? when we're still wrapping our head around the first stuff and we're still not 100% there. So we're in whatever order. Yeah, I can start there. I mean, from a compa capacity standpoint, we definitely recognize that we can't continue in the same path that, that, we've done, that we've been following. And we often think about manufacturing in terms of scaling down versus scaling up. And so by using a stable cell line, for example, versus transient transfection, you know, our long-term aspiration is very similar to what Peter Mark showed yesterday with his Pepsi machine, but if we could have individualized manufacturing in a box, um, that, that's the goal, that's the aspiration. So instead of continually building up to the 2,000 liter reactors, how do we build, how do we scale down so that we, we can address that capacity issue? Yeah, well, I, I started in AAV back in the 90s, and uh, we couldn't make enough to dose a mouse, much less a monkey. 
And so we invented packaging cell lines to, to address that. And we were still told there's no way you're ever going to get into human because you can't possibly make enough. Well, I would ask our friends at Catalyst and Thermo and uh, Resilience and, and the 10 others, uh, are they making any money making AV these days? So the answer is yes. And how many clinical trials are there now with AV? So um, innovation tends to win out in these sort of manufacturing situations, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and so certainly in our case, um, the lentiviral vector we're, we're producing is amenable to standard manufacturing processes that are available today. We're not having to invent anything. So um, it is a matter of um, coming to terms with a large CDMO to make your material. Yeah, and I would say our approach is twofold. One is to screen for capsids that have high titer manufacturability. Um, and then second of all, it's to think about how we can actually um, I, I won't talk about the capacity. There's plenty of CDMOs around here, obviously. Um, but on the design side of things, if we can actually find vectors that more efficiently transduce, are more potent, can detarget these areas that are known to be unsafe, like the liver, the spleen, DRG, you name it, then we actually can bring down the dose, and that effective dose is going to be a, a lighter lift um, for those who are manufacturing, ultimately. ask a question. Uh, there's a hand up. Uh, while the mic is getting there, I'll ask a question. Um, I noticed that one of the most popular talks or panels in this entire conference was the one about financing and investors. It used to be commercial, but then I saw this room was packed for that one. So let's ask an investor question while that's getting, making its way over. Um, we've seen investor sentiment turn, right? There was this great promise of the, all the stuff that we're working on today. And, and there is still that great promise, but there's also been you know, limitations, there's, and we've seen a souring. As you are all in the business of raise, you know, what you do because you raise money from investors, I'm curious what kind of conversations are you having with investors? Because on one hand, they could be like, yep, I want the next thing. I'm all over you guys. I can also see, eh, that stuff, uh, we're, still, we, we're yeah. still dealing with a sugar high from the last round of like transformative, disruptive technology. So what are, you, you know, what are you sensing and feeling for your approaches, uh, the investor yeah. appetite for what yeah. you're doing, or what this field may have to encounter uh, yeah. as you move forward? Anybody, Emil? Um, well, let's see, I, this is my fifth startup. Um, my second one we started in 2007, which was the worst biotech <laughs> financing, mo you know, this is worse, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so I think there's clearly market headwinds. It's more challenging. Investors don't see, you have to finance to a longer horizon. Mm -hmm. You have to show, you, they want more mature assets. They, you know, so they either want a series A, super cheap and easy, and you know, they can get a position and hold it for a while, or they want something really late stage that they feel like will get there in the, when the market opens. Um, so I think that's real, and we all feel it at various ways. That would be my summary. But I think good companies still get financed. Um, so I, I think there's no, you know, intrinsic barrier to progress right here. It's just, it's always hard. I mean, every financing round I've ever started, started one way and ended another, and they were different. So, um, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think it's just the nature of where we are today. Good companies will get financed, good stories. Um, you know, that's, that's what I'd say. But it's definitely a unique environment. Adrian looks very confident. He's nodding. Good stories are getting funded. I don't know how confident I look, but um, <laughs> we just went through Series A recently, and our experience was that there is still money and interest out there, both from large pharma as well as um, VC. As long as you show how to connect the dots between lessons learned with prior products as well as platform technologies, and the new science that you would like to translate to novel transformative products. So this concept of in vivo rational programming of human tissues and cells is of tremendous interest in my opinion, still will be to the investors. Thank you. So I'm, I usually have very few words and uh, so I'll, I'll <laughs> summarize what Emil said, data wins, mm -hmm. data will win. I was, I was expecting to hear, you know, companies lie and investors no. can tell the truth, you know. <laughs> some never seen some a company lie. No, good, great. So there was a question, I think, back there, so go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm Michelle Levine. I'm an investor, I'm very interested in this space, so it's kind of funny, the question that just came up. I definitely sure. agree that there's a lot of interest, um, and obviously in vivo, cell and gene therapy can be very transformational. My question is kind of 
geared towards more thinking into the future as you all try to enter the clinic in the next few years. Um, what do you think you know, FDA will want to see in terms of monitoring by distribution? You know, I know there's all these safety switches you can add and bells and whistles, but um, yeah, how do you think are thinking about sort of early interactions with FDA and sort of what are you hearing or thinking about what they'll want to see in the, in the phase one? Yeah, that's great. Regulatory risk, right? Is there something unique about your technology that might introduce something that we haven't seen before? Or have we learned a lot from what we learned from the first generation approaches that's directly applicable and there's no new regulatory risk? So that's a, I'm so glad that question got asked. Anybody? Can take a first step. Yeah. That's fine. And we went through that um, uh, on that journey with the first wave of uh, chimeric engineering receptor T cells 10, 12 years ago with CBER. And what we found is that if you engage them early on and develop, um, let's say, collaborative rapport with the FDA team, um, it's, a, it's a mutual learning opportunity that will be helpful both ways. Helpful to them in understanding how to actually generate that framework, regulatory framework for that type of products or platform technology and helpful for the organization, um, the company that develops that particular product. So I'm very optimistic that we'll embark again on a journey that will be um, productive both ways. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that at Dino, we're certainly contributing to industry-wide efforts to engage with the FDA to understand what are those new potential ways to think about synthetic capsids and products that have synthetic capsids in there. I think um, one vision that um, I personally have is maybe there's a future where we have a plug-and-play approach. We can treat novel capsids like formulations and be able to not have to backtrack all the way back to the beginning um, for clinical trials and actually be able to have a mechanism to understand that these synthetic capsids can be safe enough to be able to be swapped out um, further down the line in development. Well, we're down to two minutes, and so I think it's, uh, even if there are more questions, and I'm sure the panelists will make themselves available for, uh, for additional questions for the audience. So we'll get to closing uh, remarks here and statements, and I'd ask the panelists to prepare a closing statement um, a bold prediction of the future. We tend to underestimate what's, overestimate what's possible in the near term, underestimate what's possible in the long term. So ask them to have fun with this. One bold projection for the field, for your company, look out the next five to 10 years. Um, so um, in, in no particular order, I'm just gonna ask them to, uh, to go. I mean, one thing that I think about is 10 years ago, we would never have predicted where we are today. And, and I predict that 10 years from now, it's gonna be very different message up here, so <laughs> just keep it coming. <laughs> That's a safe prediction. That's, yeah. uh, that's, you went safe there, Gary. It's like, yeah, we, there's stuff we just won't have predicted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough, and that was it. Anybody? Yeah, who, I who think wants to go next? Uh, I've said this every 10 years for the last 30 years. Non-viral will win the day to deliver DNA at some point. Um, I probably won't be here when it yeah. does, but if you can figure out how to deliver DNA like viruses do, with a non-viral uh, mechanism that's easy to manufacture, that's safe, that doesn't engender immunity, um, I think you'll win. I have a neuroscience background, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to treat things like Alzheimer's, like Parkinson's, these neurodegenerative diseases that we really haven't known a lot of biology about, but also haven't really been able to treat in a meaningful way thus far. And we've had our blips along the way as an industry, but. I think we're, we're really at the cusp of being able to treat this. Um, two years from now, three years from now, we will see very few ex vivo engineering companies financed. <laughs> new companies, new companies, I should say. Yeah. There, there's yeah, one that's, that's really, really, really going to piss somebody off. Um, there's, yeah, there's some so, ex vivo yeah, company in the world. You know, three years from now, yeah. I think we'll have proven that these methods work well enough yeah. that that's the promise. That's the future. Um, I'd say I'm really excited by um, the idea of the blurring the line between um, cure and prevention. So there's multiple trials right now, like you go to the, the Verve trial, where we're flipping what is a pathogenic base, but also could be considered a susceptibility loci, and what that means for disease. So, and we're going to see that data in, in a year or two. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's, you know, that's and you have to be able to deliver in the right tool, but flipping that to where we're no longer thinking about the burden, but, but how to prevent it. 
um, that's wow. Then, then it apply it what you know what you said about yeah. advantage yeah. of being able to do it in neurodegenerative disease. And I think that within ten years we are going to see treatments that achieve durable clinical benefit through in vivo reprogramming, transient but controlled reprogramming of immune system and tissues. I, I'm going to make my, my bold prediction is that between the, what we've heard from the panels today and all of you in the audience, that we are going to get so good at what we do that we're going to prove Phil wrong. <laughs> he will be here on a panel 10 years from now, mm -hmm. and he will be here to tell us and, and, and reflect back on the last 10 years because we will be saving and extending lives. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank, Thank you so much. You.